job, you guys. I'm looking forward to reading these papers. So now let's go on and let's talk about some new style things. Let's see, how are the style, I heard a lot of good style of dress ups today. Um, have, have you started to realize which one is the most difficult for you personally? Everybody usually has one that they feel like is harder than the rest of them. What about you, Laura Kay? What do you think? Um, mine is like the strong verb, just because I want such a strong one that it's hard to like implement what I want to use. Oh, <laughs> so you probably spend a lot of time searching, right? Okay. Well, I love this quote from Thomas Mann. I used to have it on my... Um, on my board up here, but I took it down and I got a new board. And that is, a writer is someone for whom writing is more difficult than it is for other people. <laughs> so if you are spending a lot of time looking for words, who has found themselves spending a lot of time looking for the perfect word for one of your dress ups? Has that happened to anybody besides Laura Kate? Honey Rude, okay, Aiden. Um, that's great because that's what you're supposed to do in writing. You're supposed to get the perfect, and you too, Samra. You're supposed to get the perfect word that tells your reader exactly what it is you're trying to say. So, okay. Anybody else have one that they find to be very difficult? No? Sometimes people struggle with the clauses, the who, which, the www.asia, or the because clause. But generally, people will tend to feel like one is harder than the other. Okay, so up till now, we've learned six different dress-ups. And let's see, who can tell us the six? Somebody raise your hand and tell us the six without looking at your checklist. Okay, Vincent. When, while, where, as, since. Oh, no, that's the wrong one. <laughs> Who it? Okay, okay that's one. Quality adjective. Because clause, do I say strong verb? Not yet. And, and there's one more. You started out with it, but you changed your mind. The, um, the adverbial clause. Yes, the www.asia. When, while, where, as, oh, let's see. Somebody tell us what the www.asia actually stands for. Is it a website? No. Uh -oh. <laughs> it's when, while, where, as, since, if, and although. All right. And Rosa, was that what you were going to say? Okay. Were you going to say www.asia? Can you hear me, Rosa? I don't know if Rosa's, is she having trouble with her sound? Vincent, can you see if Rose is having? Okay, all right. I, I can hear. Oh yeah, yeah, yes. Okay, Vincent, never mind. She said she lost audio. Okay, that's that's good, Rosa. Okay. So what we're going to do now, now that we've learned the six dress ups, we're going to always use those from now on. For the rest of your life. <laughs> In everything that you write, okay? And the point of it. What's the point of these things? Is it just for me to make your life miserable and give you extra work to do? Because it's for, I think it's... Go ahead. It's like, it's like for your writing to get better. It does. How does it make it better? Laura, you have... Laura, Kate, you have an opinion about that? that? It develops it so that you don't sound like your source. That's true. Those, those two things are also true. There's another thing that's really important that I mentioned just a couple of minutes ago. Why do we have to use all this stuff? It does make the writing sound better, right? But it also makes your writing communicate better because remember the point of writing is not just to be understood. <clears throat> Sometimes you'll hear people say that. The point of writing is to be understood. No, that's not all there is to it. The point of writing is to make it impossible for you to be misunderstood. And so in order to communicate that way, 
<clears throat> writing is hard work. That's why you should never quickly dash off a text or an email to somebody without really thinking about what you're trying to say. It's so easy for people to get offended because they read something that wasn't very carefully written and they kind of, they find a totally different meaning than what you meant in the first place. And if you haven't had that happen to you, you probably will. So um, <clears throat> writing is hard work and making your writing say exactly what you mean is hard work, okay? So let's learn some new style. You know, I just love style. It's probably my favorite part of writing. And when I was a little girl in, um, in first grade, we were kind of slower at things than they are now in school. Um, <clears throat> I didn't actually start learning to read till I was in first grade. And I got my first reader and I thought that it was so much fun. And it was, it was, it was Dick and Jane. And people have made fun of Dick and Jane, but I just absolutely love the Dick and Jane readers. And I even have one now. But um, all of the sentences were very short. <clears throat> and they were all, um, they were all of a certain pattern. It was basically the subject and the verb and maybe one other word. So here's something like you might read in Dick and Jane in the early readers. Now they got more complicated, but the sentences still kind of stayed the same. Um, Jane is here. Jane swings high. Jane pets spot. Oh, oh, Jane fell down. Okay. <laughs> Now, they had the most beautiful pictures. If I remember, if I remember it, maybe next time I can bring it downstairs. I loved the pictures. I thought they were so beautiful. Um, they were. They were really nice illustrations. But, and for a first grader, I was just excited to be able to read. But do you think that would be very satisfying to read long term if everything you read was subject, verb, maybe an adjective or an, a, a, um, maybe a prepositional phrase. Would that be very interesting very, for very long? Mm -mm. So it's not interesting to other people either when our sentences are basically, Jane fell down. Okay, so when other people read your writing, they want to, uh, they won't really know why they don't like your writing, but it will be something like this. When I, I, I had a person that I really, um, really enjoyed a lot um, as that I knew in person who wrote a book. And when the book came out, I was so excited and I bought a copy of it. And I also bought a copy for my sister and my sister-in-law. And I gave it to my sister-in-law, who was an English major. And after I, when I gave it to her, I said, I had already read it at that point. Actually, I didn't even finish it because I said, I got this for you because she knew this person too. I'm sorry. It's just not very interesting. I said, I'm very surprised. And so she said, well, thank you for getting it for me. So the next time we talked, she said, you know, the book is good. This is before I started teaching IEW and I started being aware of these kinds of things. I just didn't like it. I didn't find it interesting. It had interesting stories in it and all that, but it was deadly boring. She said, the content is great. The problem is that they're all simple sentences, basically subject verb sentences. Well, this person had been a kindergarten teacher and she wrote like a kindergarten teacher. Okay. <laughs> so I went back and I looked at the book and I was like, well, she is exactly right. That's what's the matter with this book. So even if your reader isn't aware of why they like your reading, why you like your writing, or why they don't like your writing, they're still picking up on this stuff, okay? That's why style is so important. Having great content is really important in writing. 
you need to write about things that are interesting. You need to write about things that are true or write really great stories. But if you don't have good style, your readers aren't going to like your writing. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So that's why it's so exciting to do um, style. Now, there's a really interesting story that Andrew Pudua tells about um, a lady that came. He's the one that, he's the American side of IEW. It started in Canada. But he had a lady come to one of his, um, his seminars about IEW. And she was actually working on her thesis or a master's program, I think, or either her dissertation. Um, I can't remember which, but it was one of those big, big papers that you have to do to get an upper level degree. And she came, she learned the style, she went home, she had already turned in her paper once. You get a professor that you work with and they review your work and they tell you what changes you need to make. She went back home, she totally rewrote the paper, not the content, but the guess what? Style. <clears throat> she totally rewrote the style. She did all of the style techniques that she had learned that weekend. She turned her paper back in. And when she met with her professor, he said, I don't really know what, what you did, but it just reads better. This is much better. She didn't tell me. <laughs> so that to me just said yes style makes a difference you can have all the same facts you can have all the same information and if your style is great people are going to really like your writing whereas they will, might find it boring and give the book away at goodwill if you don't write it with good style because that's what I did ultimately with that book <laughs> Sorry to say, I just wasn't, I just wasn't strong enough to, to force my way all the way through it with the style. <laughs> um, okay, so let's learn another good style technique and turn to page 57. Who's having fun with the style? Is anybody besides me having a good time? Laura Kay, Ani Rouge, Charlotte, <laughs> Samra, Vincent. Okay, I hope the rest of you will um, say you love it later too. So let's look at page 57. And so now we're going to add a different kind of style. We've done six dress ups. Now we're going to learn six sentence types. Today, we're only going to work on three of them. And then the next time we come, we'll work on three of them. And we'll be done with learning new style until after Christmas when we start to work on descriptive writing. So a sentence type is how is the sentence actually arranged? And I told you about the most common one, which is all elementary school readers get lots of this. And I'm not making fun of elementary school readers. It's very important when you're young to read lots, lots of stuff that's easy to read. Because if you don't read lots of stuff that's easy to read and become fluent with your reading, you'll never come to enjoy reading. If you're always reading really, really hard things, you'll never have the fun of reading something that isn't hard. Does that make sense? So it's really good to listen to um, literature that's written at a level that's above your own reading level. But when you're reading, you need to read lots and lots of stuff that isn't really hard for you. And so, um, this is usually how a reader goes. They're usually what we call subject openers. And when I say subject, what is the subject? When I say the subject of a sentence, what am I talking about? Um, okay, Vincent. The thing that's doing the action in the sentence. Okay. And that thing would be considered a what part of speech, do you know? A noun, exactly. Person, place, thing, or idea. So a subject sentence, a subject, we call them subject openers, um, are sentences that start with a noun and then they are followed by a verb. Now, you can have a, you see that there in the middle of the page, subject openers? Okay, subject openers begin with nouns or pronoun. A pronoun is a little word that can take the place of a noun, like instead of saying 
Vincent, we could say he, okay? Or instead of saying um, Samra, we could say she, right? So it can start with a noun. It can start with a pronoun. It can even start with an adjective, either an article adjective or just a common old adjective, the, a, or an. Those are considered article adjectives. So if the sentence starts with the, if the sentence starts with a, if the sentence starts with an, it's still going to end up being a subject opener, okay? Or it can just start with a, a regular old adjective. So here we have an example of different ways to write a sentence about the summer. Starting with a noun, summer is the best part of the year. Pronoun, it is the best part of the year. Article adjective, the best part of the year is summer. Adjective, sweet summertime is the best part of the year. All of those count as a subject opener, okay? Because you either start with an actual noun or you start, you start with the subject of the sentence, even if there's an adjective modifying it right before that. Now these are easy and I'll bet if I went and read through your papers right now, I bet unless you've been trained to do otherwise, and some of you have because some of you have done IEW before, um, most of the sentences that we write are going to be subject openers. And we call this a number one sentence. And these are easy to get. Nobody has trouble getting a number one. So it's almost like I'm giving you a point right off the bat for your paragraph, okay? <laughs> You're going to have one of these. And the way we mark these is just like you see it here in the handbook. Now, I know IEW, if you've taken IEW before, none of their handbooks have this. They just have the brackets with the number in it. And that's it. Those are very hard to find when you're grading lots and lots of papers, just like underlines are hard to find. That's why I have y'all bold your dress ups and underlines. And now when we're doing these subject openers, each kind of sentence will have its own number and you do the brackets and then the number and then you bold it. Okay, that way I can find it. One reason it used to take me so long to grade papers was because I didn't have people bolding things and it took me an infinite amount of time to locate all of this stuff. So finally, after about 10 years, I don't think of good solutions for a long time. I all of a sudden realized I should have them bold them. Okay, Laura Kate, I'm sorry, you got light coming into your face. Yeah, it's fun. You need to get up and shut a curtain or something? It won't shut for some reason. You want to turn around and do it from the other direction? Is it possible? I hate for you to have that mm -hmm. shining in your face like that. You can move. That's fine. Okay. So that's easy. Number two is what we call a prepositional opener. Now, who in here has ever had to memorize a huge list of prepositions? Has anybody in here ever had to do that? No? There's a, there's a you have on roof. There's a, um, a grammar program that we used for a long time called um, Easy Grammar. And that was the first thing they taught was prepositions and prepositional phrases. And we had to memorize this huge list of prepositions so that the kids could mark through the prepositional phrases and they would recognize them. So a preposition is, um, it's a, a little word that Lots of times will indicate location, not always, but location is one of those things that prepositions often deal with, often deal with such as up, under, beside, beneath, by. Um, so now we don't think of prepositions as being really exciting and important, but when you use one to start a sentence, it can have a really great effect. So listen to this. Here's the most famous prepositional opener in the English speaking world. I don't know about prepositions in other languages. Well, I do know some about Spanish, but here's the most famous prepositional opener in the English speaking world. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, would it be equally true to say God created the heavens and the earth in the beginning? Same information. Which has more drama and flair to it? God created the heavens and the earth in the beginning. Or in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
which one sounds better? In the beginning first. Uh, yeah. It's got, it's such a little thing in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. But there's something about that that just goes. <laughs> the other one sounds like a report. Okay. And there's nothing wrong with sounding like a report when you're writing a report, as long as all of your sentences don't sound that way. Okay, so even tiny little prepositions can make a big difference. Look at the list with me. I have a huge list on page 66 of all the prepositions your heart could possibly desire. Now, this isn't all there are, but look on page 66 with me. Now, the thing about prepositions, remember when we talked about the, the who, which clauses and the um, www.asia clauses and the cause clauses. Clauses have a noun and a verb, okay? Sometimes they can stand on their own. We call those independent clauses. Sometimes they depend on the rest of the sentence, like the ones we learned, the www.asia or the cause clause. But they always have a noun and a verb. Prepositions <clears throat> have the little prepositional word, like in, and then they have a noun, like beginning. <coughs> they do not have verbs. If it has a, if a set of words has a verb in it, it's no longer a prepositional phrase. It is a clause, okay? And so the tricky thing sometimes for students when they're starting to label these sentences is that they'll see the preposition on the preposition list and they write a clause because it has a verb in it. And then they'll label it as a preposition. And I will mark it out and I will write clause has a verb and I will draw an arrow to the verb. <laughs> so if your set of words has a verb in it, it doesn't count as a prepositional phrase, even though it's on this list. Also, some of these same words are on this list and on the clausal list, like the word since. Do you see that <clears throat> on the one word preposition le um, list in the bottom of the fourth column? See that word since? When, while, where, as, since, if, although. Well, is it a preposition or is it a clause? How can we tell? Depends on whether there's a verb in there. If it's a verb, if there's a verb in there, it's a clause. If there's not a verb, it's a prepositional phrase, okay? Prepositional phrases aren't really hard, and I'll bet a lot of you have written plenty of prepositional phrases so far in your paper. Has anybody been aware of actually writing prepositional phrases in their paper? So I, I, I'm sorry, I'm playing with my necklace. I need to stop that. Um, <laughs> um, okay. So these are fun, they're not that hard, and I think you will have a fine time of doing them, okay? We'll look at some exercises here in a minute if we have a chance. Now turn back to page um, 57 and let's cover one more. But you're also, I, you know, I probably should have renumbered these because the way these work out is all three of the easier ones are the first, and then all three of the harder ones are last. <laughs> so we, we do easy ones this time, we do the harder ones next time, okay? okay? So look at number three. Now we're going to have an L-Y adverb opener. Now, before, I didn't care where you put your dress up, okay? So um, now you're going to have an adverb L-Y, L-Y adverb opener, and then somewhere else in the paragraph, you're going to have an L-Y adverb dress up. They can't count as the same thing. Sometimes I see people wanting to be very efficient and they'll put a number three in front of a sentence that starts with an L-Y and then they'll underline it. Why? Look there, I killed two birds with one stone. I got my number three opener and my L-Y dress up all in one fell swoop. Okay. <laughs> Why do you think I won't let you do that? First of all, let's think about what the purpose of having these dress ups and sentence types are. What is the purpose? Uh, we talked about it. Prove your writing? Yeah, we want it to we want our writing to be 
interesting and engaging and specific, right? Mm -hmm. So if you try to just use one LY and you label one as a sentence type and as a dress up, that's not variety. Remember, we want the V word. Variety is the spice of life and the spice of writing. We don't want the... <laughs> Wait a minute. The boring. Yeah, we don't want the, the B word. We don't want our writing to be boring, right? We want it to be varied and interesting. We want variety. And so if you just stick one L-Y in there and you go, wow, I got done with that quick. No, that's not, that, that sort of defeats the purpose of doing the style in the first place. Does that make sense? The purpose of doing the style in the first place is to have variety and to have our writing more exact to communicate to our reader more. So we're going to mark our dress up. No, I mean, our dress up, we're going to continue to mark with an underlined bold somewhere besides the first word of the sentence. Now, I do want one at the beginning of a sentence. That's your number three opener. And I want one somewhere else in a sentence as your dress up. Again, we're talking about variety. If all of your LYs in the whole paragraph come at the beginning of a sentence, is that variety? No, that's the sameness, right? So that's why I'm not trying to be unreasonable here. I just want your writing to be good, okay? Yes. All right. Well, let's just look at an example. Um, you're not going to have any trouble with number ones. I'm sure every single one of you have gotten a subject opener somewhere in your paragraph. Maybe all of your sentences are subject openers. Probably not because I'll bet some of you already used your LY as a subject opener, which was fine because I told you right now they could be anywhere, right? Some of you have already used www.asias at the beginning of a sentence. Some of you may have used a because at the beginning of a sentence. But more than likely, most of your sentences will be number one. So, but we're not going to worry about that right now. So let's look at number, um, let's look at page 104. And we'll do a few of these. One thing I want you to know about sentence types is that any sentence that you have written, 104, any sentence you have written can be rewritten as any other type of sentence. You might have to change the sentence. But you can always rewrite a sentence if you're missing a sentence type that you need, okay? We'll look at an example of that in a minute. Okay, now you've got your word list on page 66. But I'll bet you can do some of these prepositions without having to look at the word list. Look at, and don't call out the answer yet, everybody just look at this first sentence with me on page 104. Blank bread. It is going to be difficult to make a sandwich. Okay, is anybody thinking of the word yeah. that could fit there, the preposition? Okay, somebody tell us what the word is that could be there. Vincent. Without bread, it is going to be difficult to make a sandwich. Yes, without, and you will find that on your preposition list. <laughs> Notice there's no... Notice there's no verb in there. Without is the preposition. Bread is the noun. There's no verb. That means it's a prepositional phrase, okay? Okay, here's the next sentence. Blank 1776, America has been a free country. Everybody think about it just for a minute. Okay, Rosa. Since 1776, America has been a free country. Exactly. So the prepositional phrase is since 1776. Notice there's no verb in there. America has been a free country. Okay. Um, now this next one really is a what we call a phrasal preposition. That means it has two preposit two words that make up the preposition. But I left off the first bit of it. Blank for zucchini. I like all vegetables. Laura Kate. Except? Except for zucchini. I like all vegetables. Now, actually, except for really goes together, and they're what we call, if you saw on that list at the bottom of that page, a phrasal preposition. It means that there's more than one little word that makes up the actual preposition. Okay? 
Okay, now this next one has lots of choices, so I want everybody to come up with one. Blank the window, a beautiful butterfly bush bloomed. That's a what you call an alliteration. Okay, Charlotte. Outside the window, a, bu a beautiful butterfly bush bloomed. Excellent. Another choice. On top of the window, a beautiful butterfly bloomed. Good, on top of, and that's also a phrasal preposition. It takes two words to make it, Vincent. In the window, a beautiful butterfly bush bloomed. Great. Um, let's see, who else? Laura Kate. Beyond the window, a beautiful butterfly bush bloomed. Great, Rosa. In front of the window, a beautiful butterfly bush bloomed. Super, in front of, you hear that? That's a three word. Phrasal preposition. Samra? <coughs> Did you raise your hand, Samra? Oh, I've lost your I've lost your sound somehow. Try again. Uh, Can you hear me now? Say it again. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, yes. Now I can. I don't know what happened. Okay. Um, I was going to say, um, behind the window, a beautiful butterfly zoom. Good. All right. And let's see. I think everybody's done one except Aiden. You got one for us, Aiden? Yeah. Next to the window, a beautiful butter butterfly bush bloomed. Super. And that's another phrasal preposition, next to. Okay. Um, now let me tell you, let's see. Another thing you can do, I said you can rewrite sentences all the time as a different type. So if I have a sentence that says, Georgia's homes, farms, crops, and towns were wiped out by the end of the Civil War, and say I was writing a paragraph about the Civil War in Georgia, and I got through putting all my style in and I realized, oh, I don't have a prepositional opener. Hmm, I wonder if I can rewrite this sentence as a prepositional opener. First, I can look and see, maybe I have a sentence with a preposition in it that I can just move to the front. So then I rewrote this one. And what could I say here that would make this um, a correct prepositional <coughs> opener sentence? Vincent. By the end of the Civil War, all of Georgia's homes, farms, crops, and towns were wiped out. Exactly. You see how Vincent took that by the end of the Civil War and he just moved that whole prepositional phrase to the beginning. That makes sense? Okay. Um, thousands of people died because of the lack of food. Oh, here's something I forgot to tell you. If you look at that list on page 66, you'll find because of listed as a preposition. If there's that little word of right after because, it's a preposition. So sometimes people try to fake me out and they'll have because of in their paragraph and they'll just underline the because and they won't underline the of and they'll try to make off like that's their because dress up, but it's not. Because if that little word of comes after it, it becomes a preposition. Now, I don't really know why. I'm sure there's some grammar nut that could tell me why that's true but always if you have because of it's going to be a preposition if it's because it's going to be a clausal starter Isn't that crazy okay so thousands of people died because of <laughs> how could we redo this sentence as a prepositional opener laura kate because there was an immense lack of food, thousands of people died. Oh, yes. Laura Kate cannot, cannot help herself but to improve the sentence. Good job. That's exactly right. Um, well, actually, because there was. Actually, no, that's a clause because it's not because of. Okay, now redo it, Laura Kate. Remember that any sentence can be written as any other kind of sentence. So Laura... Kate just wrote a clausal opener sentence. Now do it with the because of. Oh, you did. You did say because of the 
Did you say because there was or because of? I say because there was, but that's okay. Hard. Now do it again and make it a preposition with the of in there. Because of the immense lack of food, thousands of people died. Exactly. You see how easily Laura Kate did that? Mm -hmm. She really, clausal openers, I think, are harder than prepositional openers. So Laura Kate automatically went to the harder one, um, <laughs> which is admirable. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. So that's how you can do in if you look for a preposition that's already a prepositional phrase that's already in your sentence, sometimes you can move it to the beginning. Not always. Sometimes it turns out really weird. So you got to listen to it and see if it still makes sense. OK. Um, so, for instance, if you look at number four, northern carpetbaggers and southern scalawags swarmed into the south during Reconstruction. You've got two prepositional phrases there. One of them will sound very poetic. Into the south, northern carpetbaggers and southern, southern scalawags swarmed. During Reconstruction, northern carpenter, car, carpetbaggers and southern scalawags swarmed into the south. So either way, you can change that around. You probably wouldn't want to say into the south during Reconstruction. That would be kind of clunky sounding. Okay, now let's also look at number, mm, oh dear, well, I really want to do this because this is one of my favorite things here, this next exercise, but we might just have to wait. I'll see if we have time after we do this next part, okay? I wrote these um, exercises when I was teaching Georgia history one year, and this is one of my favorite sets of exercises that I wrote and a set of exercises about Lucy Craft Laney, um, who is a Georgia educator. She was the first black female Georgia educator. And she actually started her schools right here in Augusta, Georgia, where I live. So she's a fascinating person. Um, but we'll come back to that if we can. Let's see. Okay, so we better switch gears here. Now, remember when we first started doing keyword outlining a few weeks ago, we got our keyword outlines from the paragraphs, and we just went sentence by sentence outlining each sentence. And that's how we got our keyword outlines. Remember that? It's starting to already fade away into the mist of time. And then last time we were together, we started getting our keyword outlines a little bit differently. How did we do that? Somebody tell us what the procedure was that we went through. Laura Kate. By underlining key facts. Okay. And how do we know which ones to pick? The ones that were interesting or important. Exactly. So, you know, remember I gave you, I held up that encyclopedia article about India that had like, 25 pages, and I said, uh, yeah, just keyword outline this whole thing and then write some paragraphs from it. That wouldn't really be very reasonable of me, would it? And so we have come up with a different way when we have a bunch of information that we have available. We don't want to, um, we, we, we have to have some way of deciding exactly what we're going to use. So that's what we did. Well, now we're going to take that a, a step further. And this is one of my favorite things about IEW. When I first saw this, when I first started teaching IEW to my own children, and I saw Andrew Pudawa teaching about this, I thought, why didn't anybody tell me about this? <laughs> How have I gone this far into my life and not learned this wonderful way of taking notes for a research paper? And this is called fused, called fused outlines. What do I mean? What, what does the word fused mean? Who can tell us what fused means? If you fuse something together, what does that mean? Put something together? Yes. It means to take some different parts and make them one thing, right? Okay. Normally, when you write papers for a class, you're not going to be allowed to take all of your information out of one source. 
I'm sure some of you have probably already had experience with this. Who's ever had to give, do a research paper and you had to use several different sources for your information? Okay, Laura, Kate, Rosa, um, Vincent. Okay, well, in the real world that people are so fond of talking about, when you have to do a paper for a research class or a research paper for a class, um, normally you've got to use at least two sources, sometimes way more than two, okay? So you have to have some way of dealing with all that massive information. Now, <clears throat> I told you all on the assignment sheet to start coming up with an idea to use for your research report. Has everybody been talking to your editor about that so far? Okay, and, and um, what I'm gonna have you do is open up your ThinkWave and I want you to send me a message on ThinkWave on assignment number four about what you're going to be writing about. Can everybody open ThinkWave where you are? Are y'all able to do that? Yeah. Okay. So if you could open up ThinkWave and go to assignment number four, it gives you a place to send a message to me, right? And if everybody could just put down what your subject is and what your three topics are going to be. Because when you come back to class next time, you have to bring your, your, your sources with you to class, okay? Um, I don't think I can get huh? it from here. What? I don't think I can get it from here. I don't think I can, you can. access things. No. Okay. Um, well, if you can't do it from, from there, you can do it as, when class is over. Does everybody know how to find that? Yes, Rosa? Um, should we put our three topics in too? Yes. So, Rosa, what are you doing? Um, I picked Louisa May Alcott. Oh, I love her. Okay, um, let's see. I'm just trying to open up my ThinkWave here. So if you open up ThinkWave, um, assignment number four, and you will see this little here. Just click on that and it'll give you a place to send me a message, okay? So say I'm Maya and I'm gonna say, um, um, okay, let's see, I wanted to do Corey Ten Boom and I might do early life, um, career, and then um, prisoner of war, okay? And then you hit the arrow and send it. I'm not going to send it because this is Maya's, and I don't want to. Uh, <laughs> she would probably look at it and go, <laughs> what? What is that about? Okay, so there's my, there's my subject, and then there's my three topics, okay? Anybody have a question about that? Can everybody get on ThinkWave and do that for me on assignment number four? I cannot write. Okay, well, just do it after class. That way I'll, I'll have it written down and I won't lose it. That's the mm -hmm. problem sometimes. People send me stuff and I, and I write it down and then I, it's not anywhere where I can find it later, okay? So if you haven't ch chosen your research subject yet um, and you need help, then we can talk about that. It should be something that is worth spending some time on. So I have some students in uh, my local level one class and their mother texted me yesterday and said, can we do, um, let's see, let me find it. It was a good text. She said, I'm having trouble opening this. Um, is it okay if both of my kids have the same research topic but different content? 
we were going to do microbes, that's going to be their subject, bacteria, virus, and protozoa. It's in line with what we are studying in science. So they, they both are doing the same subject in the same three topics, but they'll be doing their own research, okay? But anyway, you want it to be something that's worth spending your time on. I, I love Louisa May Alcott. That'll be a wonderful paper. Biographies are really great. If you're going to pick a biography person, it needs to be somebody that's significant, not like your favorite rock star, okay? <laughs> because it, not, don't do some cultural, you know, current cultural fad. That's not going to be a good thing to do, okay? We want it to be something that's going to be worth spending time on and that something you're interested in. Okay, so let's see. Anybody else picked their subject and three topics yet? Laura Kate, what are you doing? Um, donuts, just because I'm a baker. Oh, so what what on earth can you say about donuts? What are your three topics? Um my topics are the history the shapes, and then the popular donuts throughout the United States. Okay. You might want to go into, in, in one of them, maybe on the shapes, maybe um, like, you know, what exactly is it that you, I mean, I know obviously it's flour and sugar, but I don't really know anything else. <clears throat> one time I ordered something from the people that published my book, my, my handwriting, my writing class books, and they sent me this book called open your own donut shop <laughs> something that somebody <laughs> published through create space or something i was like what i mean it was the same size and all as mine i don't know if somebody just got mixed up when they were packing but um anyway i wish i still had that i'd give it to you but i think i took it to goodwill i take lots of books to goodwill um <laughs> yeah. i'll let other people make the donuts so you actually make donuts yes um I was going to do the history like in the Little House books and she like twists them and then they flip themselves. Okay. And, you know, go back and find the history of where did, where did, were donuts first created? Um, what were the forerunners of donuts? Uh, you know, find as much history as you can. And, and have you run this by your editor and your editor's good with this? Okay. Well, I'm sure there's a lot more to donuts than I have, um, an idea about okay so here's a question Krispy Kreme or Dunkin Donuts Krispy Kreme all the way <laughs> yeah we love Krispy Kreme donuts okay y'all probably don't have Krispy Kreme donuts up there I'll tell you what's really popular up north I found and uh, let's see y'all are kind of up north uh, Vincent and Rosa and I think Samra too no Samra you're in California right um they um Look, these little private donut shops. They're just, do y'all have that where you are, Rosa and Vincent? Like, they're little, like, freestanding mom and pop donut shops? Okay, yeah. maybe not. Okay, so I got to go to some of those when I was in Michigan one time. But, okay, all right, let's see. Uh, Vincent, what are you doing? I'm probably going to write about chickens. <laughs> oh, Somebody did chickens one time in the past. I really, I like chickens. You know, it's so relaxing to watch them. If you can just sit down on a, on a, on a chair out in the yard and just kind of watch them, you know, pecking around. <laughs> I like chickens a lot. I like to eat them too. Okay, Aiden, have you picked out yours? Yeah, I'm going to do this really cool frog called the Titty Kaka Water Frog. So. Ooh, okay. And can you find enough? Oh, the main thing is, you guys, You've got to be able to find enough information. So make sure you can do that. Like early in the week, I think it'll say it. Go get your go get your stuff. Because I have had students who decided to write about something kind of obscure and then they just couldn't find the information. You've got to have at least one actual book and two articles. Wikipedia cannot be used as an article, okay? Right. But the great thing about Wikipedia is... Okay, let's let's just use uh, Aiden's here as a what if um, spell that frog for me, Aiden. I don't know how to spell that frog. It's really hard to hang on. Let me. Um, Wait a minute. It might be this. Ah, there we go. Let's see. Hold on a minute. I'm gonna open this up. 
Okay, let me show you this because this is important. And then we've got to get started talking about this homework assignment. Okay, let me show you this. All right, so the first thing that almost always pops up when you start looking for articles is guess what? Wikipedia. Wikipedia. Yes. And so what you want to do is, let me try to get it open so I can see everybody. Um, go to Wikipedia, all right? But you're not going to use Wikipedia itself as the actual article. Down here at the bottom, any, any article that's got hard, uh, anything that's really interesting, first of all, you'll find this awesome contents box here. So here's the possible topics for the Titicaca water frog. Appearance, habitat and ecology, behavior, conservation status and threats, conservation measures. And then we've got this wonderful thing. So we can go, oh, I think I'll write about their appearance, their habitat and ecology, and their behavior. That's good. That was three good topics for them. Okay. But I cannot use this as my source. But look what I can use. Right down here at the bottom, it says references and external links. Any significantly sized article on Wikipedia is going to have a treasure trove of sources for you. Look at all this. And luckily, um, we'll know which ones go with which topic because... Uh, let's say we're doing appearance, um, Aiden, okay? We go to appearance, and they tell you exactly what articles come under appearance, okay? And so you can check out these articles and find out if there's something there listed in the Wikipedia article that you could actually use, because you can't use Wikipedia. It's just not allowed anywhere. And does anybody know why it's not allowed? Because it can easily copy and paste. Well, that's part of it. Charlotte, why do you think it's not allowed? Doesn't it have some, like, false information? Yeah, anybody can go in and they can put anything in any of these articles. You know, like, so well, there was an article about the Declaration of Independence and somebody went in there thinking they were being funny, I guess, suppose, and said that Ben Franklin wrote the Declaration of Independence. He most certainly did not. It was Thomas Jefferson and but an unaware person might put that in a paper. So that's why you can't use it. Some of the articles on Wiki are extremely good, but you cannot ever count on it. So you have to just use Wikipedia as a launching pad for research, not as the actual source. But look at that. That's way more information than anybody could probably ever use. Yes, Rosa. Um, do we have to use references at the bottom of Wikipedia? Because there's sometimes other articles that you can just find. Oh, no, you don't have to. But if you're having trouble finding it or you're not sure what topics you want to use, Wikipedia is a great place to start. Like, I don't know if Aiden knew that these were possible topics. I didn't ask him what his topics were. But appearance, habitat, and ecology, and behavior would be great for your topics. Okay? Um. So, all right, so I better stop talking about that now and then start talking about the other thing. All right, we got to get on with this. Okay, I love colored sticky tabs. These are one of the most useful things you'll ever use in school, okay? So everybody just go ahead and open them, all right? Now, what we're going to do is we're going to figure out what possible topics we have available to do our um, paper, which is going to be on um, whales. And let's see, let me just fix this here. And so I've given you this, this we're going to just pretend like these are full-fledged books, okay? And all of these little um, headings here. These are going to be like our chapters, all right? So, let's see. You should have, you should have a book A, and it says it right up here at the top. Book B, and book C. Does everybody have all three of those? Okay, 
and they all should be folded. Are, are everybody yep. started? Okay. Okay. So the first thing we got to do when we start to do a research paper is we got to find out what topics are available for our research paper. Now we just found out what topics are available for the Titicaca water frog. That was pretty easy. Okay. But sometimes we've already got sources and we want to read through our sources and find out, you know, what topics are available. Remember when we were looking at that India article last week, I was just kind of, uh, encyclopedias are a great place to find out possible topics. I was just going through and reading the bold headings, okay? <clears throat> In full-fledged books, you would want to look at the table of contents, okay? Now, we don't have table of contents for these, but we do have some possible topics. <clears throat> and so I'm going to do a screen share here. And we're going to make a list of the topics that we have available for this, um, this particular article. Now, I hope I'm not going to have trouble with this again. Um, I know I have had trouble with it a few times here. Um, okay, no, I'm not going to have trouble with it. Okay, so everybody pick up book A, and let's write down some topics that we have available in book A. Um, and so take out a piece of paper and turn it sideways. And across the top, I want you to write A, B, B across the side, A, B, and C, because we're gonna we're gonna figure out what in each of our in each of our books, what do we have available to write about? Okay. So in book A, I want, um, let's see, somebody can read these little headings. These are what I would call chapter headings in this particular thing. We can chapter headings, and I'm going to write them down, and we're going to find out what topics are available in each of our sources here. So let's see, who can, okay, Charlotte, tell us what we have available in book A. Things. Yes, the little headings on the side, uh-huh. Okay. Um, body, migration, family. Okay, start, start, start with the front, with, with, this, with this page here. Oh, okay. Mammals. Okay, mammals. And y'all write these down too, okay? Body. Body, okay. Migration. Migration. Family groups. Family groups. And singing. Singing. Okay. Does everybody see where we're getting those? Right here on the, on mm -hmm. the side here. Okay, let's see. Somebody else pick up book B, and let's quickly list our topics for book B that we have available. So when you're first doing a paper... What you want to do is find out what information you have, and you want to get some. You want to get topics where there's a pretty good bit of information. Okay, so um, let's see. Somebody read the topics that are listed in the headings on book B. History. History. Oops. Wait a minute. History. Okay. Migration. Okay. Uh, my diet. Diet. Okay. Body. Body. Okay. And acrobats. Acrobats. Great. Thank you. Okay, now somebody do tell us what the topics are for book C. Okay, Laura Kate. Body. Body. History. History. Family groups. Family groups. Singing. Singing. And migration. Migration. Okay. Now, what do y'all notice about these, um, these, topics that we've listed. Does anything jump out at you? 
uh, Rosa? A and C are the same, except um, C, um, A has mammals. Okay. So you're saying that a lot of these have the same, same topics, right? The information might be different, but the topics tend to be the same. So some of these have two different sources for the topic. Some of them have three. Um, what's one of them that has three sources for the topics listed? Just look at the list that you made on the paper. Body. Okay, so we've got body here and body here mm -hmm. and body here, all right? What's another topic that we have three listed for? Does anybody see another one? Migration. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, so we've got migration, migration, migration. So that's that's a pretty good bit of information we've got about the body and that we've got about migration, right? Mm -hmm. um, okay, now the others don't have so many, but there are some that have two um, sources listed with the same topic, and what would those be? Uh, history. Singing. Singing. Okay, so I've heard history, I've heard singing. Okay, let's do singing, and let's do... Family groups. Family groups. And I heard somebody say history. Um, let's see, we've got history. Looks like we've circled everything except for mammals. Now, I'm thinking that probably mammals might, since we know that mammals have certain body characteristics, we might even be able to use some of this together with the body topic, possibly, okay? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Now, we don't have anything else listed for diet. But we might be able to use some of that when we start talking about migration, possibly. Okay, we'll put a question mark there. Now we've, we're left with this little poor little acrobats thing together. But I came up with a super topic one time that ended up putting acrobats in with something else. I wonder if anybody can guess what that is. Laura Kay. Singing? Yes! And what do you think I called my super topic? Um, entertainment. <laughs> yeah, entertainment would be great. I actually called it talents. <laughs> <laughs> so I might put these together in one thing together and make a topic, okay? So what I want to do first is let's just try taking some notes because the thing is, is once you start trying to take notes from a lot of different sources on the same topic, it can get really messy. Has anybody ever done the old, um, does everybody have this written down? I've actually got a copy of this on the on ThinkWave for you, but um, has anybody, if you didn't get it finished, that's okay. I've got a copy of it. Has anybody ever had to collect notes on note cards before for a paper? Yeah, it's really annoying, especially if you tend to lose things or if you happen to drop them and they all get out of order, right? There is a better way. Turn to page 152 and we're gonna fill this in, okay? All right, <clears throat> pick up many, let's see, we know from the sad history of whales that actually what we don't have is um, any information in book A for sad history of whales, right? So what we wanna do here is mark that out. Let me fix this here. We want to just go ahead and put a big X over that because we know from the little graph that we just made out that we don't have anything about the sad history of whales. This is our topic. 
And you're all going to use this as one of your topics. So you don't even have to make your keyword outline because we're going to make it here in the class. Okay. So now we know we've got some information about sad history of Wales in book B and sad history of Wales in book C. So what I want you to do is pick one of your colors of colored sticky tabs. And I want you to put the colored sticky tab where it says what the topic is. Okay. So here's sad history of Wales on book B. And that way, when you're reading for a research paper, what you want to do is while you're reading, instead of stopping and taking the time to write down notes, you just have your handy sticky tabs while you're reading and you stick it on the edge, edge of the page so that your, your time can be spent reading. And then you decide later, oh, what am I going to go back and take notes from, okay? And so we want to use one color for each topic. If you put orange on three different topics, that's not going to be very helpful, right? So whatever your second topic is, you need to pick a different color. And whatever your third topic is going to be, you need to pick a different color, all right? But I picked orange for this. It really doesn't matter as long as you've got a plan, okay? So let's look at book B. And let's start making some notes here about Bad history of Wales. Okay, so I'm just going to read through it real quick and I'm going to decide what I think is interesting or important and I'm going to write it down. Okay, Wales, is everybody with me on book B on the front here where the history is? Yes. Wales have a sad history. Only a century ago, there were 100,000 humpbacks. Today, there are only 10,000, half of which feed in Canadian waters. For a century, whaling ships equipped with exploding harpoons sailed the seas looking for whale oil for soap and whale meat for cat food. Slaughter was horrific. Ultimately, humpbacks became commercially extinct, which means they were too few to be profitable. In 1966, they were given worldwide protection. While in Atlantic Canada, they are slowly increasing in number, on the Pacific coast, the outlook is less cheerful. The whale's history is tragic. Okay, so what, I, I picked this as my topic sad history of Wales. So we don't need to put that down. Um, let's see, let's go ahead and start reading this again. Only a century ago, there were 100,000 humpbacks. So I'm gonna do 100 years ago, 100,000 humpbacks. And y'all fill out your form as we do this. Okay. Today, there are only 10,000, half of which feed in Canadian waters. So I'm just going to do, I don't really care where they feed. Today, only 10,000. Okay. Um, I'm not going to do that. I don't, I don't care about them being in Canada. For a century, whaling ships equipped with exploding harpoons sailed the seas looking for whale oil for soap and whale meat for cat food. Now, I think exploding things are kind of cool and interesting. So I'm going to do whaling ships with exploding harpoons. Remember, we can have four words per point now, okay? <clears throat> Slaughter was her, oh, let's see. Oh, I think this is cool. Um, oil, let's see. Oil for soap. Meat for cat. food. Like my cat? <laughs> oh, okay. And let's see. I think this is kind of important. Um, let's see. 1966 World Wide Protection. Okay, 
Now, I don't have to have all the facts from the paragraph. I only need five because I'm going to get five more from the next book, okay? And then I'm going to be putting them together in a fused outline. Um, okay. I wonder if this is that crazy thing where I can't move the page up and down. Let me see. Um, oh. Why can't I? Why can't I? Uh, okay. Well, let me just do that. Let me do C. Okay. So let's pick up book C and let's quickly get our information from book C. So we see that history starts on the bottom of the page here. So let me read this. The history of Wales demonstrates that humans only love you after you can ex after you exterminate your species, your species. Now, okay. Do you think that counts as a fact that we would want to put down as a fact? No. What, does, what should that count as? <laughs> An opinion. Be a, an opinion. Yes, it's an opinion I don't happen to agree with. So I am definitely yeah, not yeah. going to put that down as a fact. We only want actual facts, okay? We can come to our own opinions later. <laughs> write it. I'm not going to write that down. In the world, many humpback populations have been wiped out. True or false? Is that a fact or an opinion? That's a fact. That's a fact. So I'm going to put that down. Many humpback, and I'm just going to say pops. What's a word I could use instead of wiped out? What about just destroyed? Would that work? Destroyed. Okay. Um, Greenpeace was founded in Vancouver in 1970 to save the whales from the harpoon. Would you consider that a, a fact or an opinion? Fact. Definitely a fact. It's historic. Greenpeace, 1970, save whales. Okay. Um, probably pollution and contamination are more deadly. Does that sound like a fact? I, I think they. I think it is a fact. I just think they really weakened it with that word probably. Right? So, I mean, we yes. don't have cartoons much now, but pollution and contamination. I'm going to say new problem. How about that? Instead of more deadly, I'm just going to say it's the new problem. Harpoons aren't really the problem anymore. It's pollution and contamination. And I'm going to, let's see, oil spill pollute, poison waste pollute, nuclear test pollute. So oil, poison, nuclear. So I'm going to just list that there. Um, now hunting with video cameras, whale lovers spend millions each year, but unless the oceans are cleaned up, the humpbacks will not repopulate the seas. Do I need all that stuff about video cameras? What's the important part of that sentence? Let's see. What about not cleaned? Not cleaned. Um, not repopulate. How about this? Would that do? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now what I want to do, if I can figure out how to do it with this thing, because I can't see where my, um, hold on a minute, let me turn that off. Um, oh, I need to go back to my mouse, that's right. I always forget how to do this. Um, what I need to do here is, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Yeah, I remembered that there was something that did that. I couldn't remember what it was. Um, okay, so what I want to do, this is so annoying. I want to pick out the facts that I want. And notice, even though this is moving up and down, I've only got seven lines. So I've got 10 facts. Am I going to be able to use all my facts? No, I want you to choose. So say I've decided that I'm going to use... Um, 
this one. I'm going to circle the facts that I want. How about that? I'm going to circle my facts. Why is this not making my, hmm. I'm having so much trouble with my thing here. Okay. I think I'm going to use this fact, this fact, this fact, this fact, this fact, this fact, and this fact. That's seven. And I'm going to move them and I'm going to write them down here. Okay. So, Laura Kate, you have a question? Yes. Um, are we only allowed to use like one fact or can we like combine them like we do? You can time? combine them, but I do. And, and it'll be easier when you've actually pick out a subject that's got like three um, sources, right? It's a little harder this time not to use all of them, right? Um, but what you want to do is the, if you can combine them, yes, you can <laughs> use more than just the seven. But right now, I really want you to concentrate on choosing and not using every single thing. We've already chosen some things, right? Um, but if you can combine them, then let's see, like here, we could actually do now 10,000, right? We actually could do that. Rosa, do you have a question? Can we have less than seven? No. <laughs> No, <laughs> uh, I want you, y'all are all older, and so I want you to have good, full paragraphs, okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Let me just show you here. I've actually made one out for you to use, and then I'm going to have to let y'all go. So this is your job for the current assignment. Um, if you look at... Um, um, I have actually made out this thing for you, and I will put it up on ThinkWave so you can print it. And here's, here's a fully created fused outline, okay? So this is what I chose to put down on my fused outline. And if you want to use my fused outline, you can for sad history, or you can make out your own fused outline, okay? This is the part you're actually gonna write from. This part right. When you go to write, you're gonna write from this part where you have put the, put the sources together. Isn't that easier than the old note card thing? Oh, so much easier. Okay, so you're gonna actually write from that and then you're gonna make out two more. If you look on page, um, 153 and 154, you'll see two blank fused outline forms, which you're also going to have on ThinkWave to print off. So don't write them in your book because you're going to need to turn them in. Um, or you can write them in your book and then rewrite them, you know, to turn in as your PDF. Um, you want to choose two other topics. So like I might choose, um, I like the talents topic myself. I might choose singing and acrobat acrobatics for one of my topics, call it talent. And I might choose uh, migration for my other topic, okay? It's up to you which topics you want to use, okay? You get to decide. Just like you got to decide on the elephant one, you get to decide on the the whale one, but make sure that you take on your fused outline, you take notes from each of the sources that where your topic appears, okay? And also make sure that you put sticky notes of the right color. So if, if I was going to do say singing and acrobatics, I might choose to do blue on book A. I mean, book C, and I might choose to do, when I, and I'm going to use blue for all of these, um, all these talent topics. Um, here's the acrobatics one. I'll stick a blue one on that. And then um, singing. I just love the whale singing and acrobatics. I just think it's fascinating. That's why I would choose to write about it, because I think that's interesting. It might not be very important. But it's certainly interesting, right? And so now I've got three things marked. 
for singing. Okay. Uh, well, actually, two of them are singing and one of them is acrobatics. And I'm going to call that topic what? Entertainment. Entertainment. <laughs> yes, entertainment. Laura Cape says entertainment. I say talents. There might be some other things there. Um, artistry or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> so you can call that a topic if you want to. Um, does anybody have any questions? Oh, you might want to mark your page with a sticky note so you make sure you're on the right one. We will now be on page 203, okay? And I hope that you'll enjoy using the sticky tabs as much as I do. You're going to find them great to have a, around when you start reading your sources for your big paper that you're going to be writing. And again, we're not doing an introduction and conclusion for this. This is going to be a three-paragraph report. Don't get disturbed. We will soon be learning about writing introductions and conclusions, okay? But that's not what we're working on right now. What we're working on is learning to take notes from a number of sources and fuse them together into one outline for our paragraph, which is a great skill to have and much easier than the old note card thing. I almost went nuts doing those note cards when I was your age. So I was glad to say bye-bye to that technique. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Rosa. <laughs> okay. Um, any questions before we go? You might have to um, ask, or you might have to tell Rosa what we finished up saying. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit late with y'all. There was a lot to cover and we still didn't get to do our exercises. Um, any questions that anybody has right now? I think that the paper is, the, the instructions are self-explanatory, but I am going to go back and post my things that for some reason are missing. I don't know why they're missing on ThinkWave. So you will have them for your homework, okay? I'm gonna do that as soon as I get off of here. Any questions right now? Nope. Okay, well, we went through a lot. So if you do have questions, be sure and get in touch with me, okay? Don't okay. suffer in silence. If you have a question, somebody else probably does too. All right? Okay. Okay. Thank y'all. It was a lot of fun. See you. See ya. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.